What is the ramification of all of this working from home? Uh, I'll give you an example. 95% of HMRC staff now spend at least one day a week working from home uh, and their customer service has dropped, I quote, to unacceptable levels. I mean, I've got to say, right, Aaron... I think something has changed in the British psyche since COVID. And I think that we are now, we've come to almost accept, even begrudgingly, absolutely diabolical service. You ring a company now, no matter who it is, and you almost know, do you know what, I'm going to put my phone down there, I'll stick it on hold and I'll go off and do whatever, do the dishes, whatever I'm going to do, because I know they're going to take mm. ages. But it's not acceptable. So I guess I'm pondering two things today. Is working from home, you know, all these people going off, is it progressive? Is it something we should encourage? Or is it absolutely <clears throat> battering customer service? It's huge. It is absolutely huge what's happening with work from home. It's a, it's a revolution in how we work. In our game, in journalism, I think you can absolutely work from home. Let's say you do a five-day week, you can work from home Two days a week, for instance, if you're writing things. I actually like working from home because you're doing deep work. You can't be interrupted. Do you, have, do you have kids? Well, one's on the way. Well, there you go. That's exactly... I'm going to talk to you in a year's time. Exactly. No, no, that's absolutely, that's absolutely true. But r at the moment, my present situation is I can definitely work more intensely at home than I can in the office. That said, I think it's hugely important for people to be in the office. I think the idea that you can do all your work from home is deeply damaging. You know, I think a good mix is three in the office, maybe two at home or 1.5 at home. But there's a few deeper lying things here which are really interesting. So like I say, the UK is the, is the leader. The US is second, which really surprises me, Michelle, because of course the US has this culture of, you know, work till you drop. And then who's bottom? Italy. So Italy is this country we sort of associate with quite a, let's be, let's be, you know, quite polite, quite a lackadaisical work culture. And yet they're showing up to the office more than Brits and Americans. So I think something interesting has happened. I think we probably aren't quite on top of it yet. I have a theory, though, which is that because we have such poor and expensive childcare in this country, many people are looking at work from home as really a cheap alternative because it works out better than maybe sending your kid to care five days a week or four days a week, you just do it two instead. And I understand that because it's so expensive in this country. If we make childcare much cheaper, then I think you have a much stronger basis on which to argue, look, you have to show up, you've got no excuses. Connor? Uh, so I don't put it down to the childcare cost. I, I don't think childcare should be incentivised. And I, we've had this debate before. Michelle, I think actually one of the positive benefits of work from home, and I'm going to steal this from, from my friend Mary Harrington, she sees the idea that women can go back to work from home, do more part-time, flexible, remote working hours, alongside having their kids around them, rather than just be stuck in an office and distance from their kids, is actually a positive development. Because lots of women during lockdown found that they enjoyed spending more time with their family. And frankly, quite a few men as well, because it's only in the last couple of hundred years that we've been working predominantly outside the home, distanced from our family. The problem I actually have with working from home is for people my age. If you are just entering the economy, particularly after lockdown, and you're trying to get your foot on the ladder, and you haven't been in the office environment... I'm very happy to say that I'm around all my colleagues five days a week, despite the very long and difficult commute because the trains are rubbish. But you don't build that camaraderie, you don't network, and you don't establish yourself as part of a company that isn't as interchangeable as it were if you were just a remote contractor who is ultimately fungible. So I think it has benefits for people that already have established families, but for young people, the working from home trend can drive further atomization. I think it breeds laziness. I do. Um, I know someone that was getting a washing machine delivered a couple of mornings ago, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> At 8.34 in the morning, they're working from home, and the guy is ringing the doorbell, ringing the doorbell, ringing the doorbell, delivery guy. No answer. Why? Because they're in bed. And I think to myself, why are you in bed when you're working from home? At 8.34 in the morning. Mm. Because if you was getting up, you're getting showered, you're getting dressed, you're going to work and all the rest of it, you're there, you're on, you're in your work mode. And I just worry, like the average answer of the call times, for example, at HMRC, is now 22 minutes. 22 minutes, right? The average wait time at the same um, uh, department was five minutes in 2020, apparently. And I think what's happened, and I've got my soapbox now, I do apologise, <laughs> but I think what's happened with a lot of companies throughout COVID, they probably downsized some of their staff. That's right. Um, and then they thought, hang on a second, customers will accept. Instead of us answering the phone in five minutes, we're now going to answer the phone in 10 minutes. We'll push it to 15. We'll push it to 20. And you get these daft old messages where they'll say, you know, you've called us an exceptionally busy time. No, I have not. Mm -hmm. I could call you at any time of the day and you would be playing that message. I would like to see 
companies fined for bad customer service. Uh, I would like customers to be more proactive in removing their business and taking it to other places and providers and voting with our kind of pounds, shillings and pence, so to speak. Um, but am I just being a bit old fashioned and fuddy duddy? No, I don't think you are, actually. And I think there's, there's something to be said also for the well-being of employees. A lot of workers need to be around other people. Being by yourself all the time is incredibly bad. You know, we have an epidemic of loneliness in this country and in our culture more generally without, you know, the insertion of doing everything over Zoom, Slack and Asana and various project management tools. So I, I agree with you. And I think there is also a broader dynamic, which is lots of employers have downsized their offices. They think, oh, actually, fewer people can come in rather than give people a pay rise because we know that employees basically look at work from home as akin to around an 8% pay rise. Rather than do that, you can do the work from home. What I think we're looking at right now, Michelle, is that, like I said at the start, it's a revolution in, in terms of how we work. And I think lots of managers, lots of businesses, lots of organisations, it's going to take them a couple of years. For some, it's definitely a bonus. It works. For others, it definitely doesn't. You know, I think we have to also think about the fact that the, the open plan office is possibly the worst possible environment in which you can concentrate and do deep, meaningful work. And that is, that is just a scientific fact. There's a great writer out there called Cal Newport, written an immense, about, uh, um, immense amount about it. So I think it's about a balanced experimentation. But I agree with you. This default that it's always good, absolutely not the case. Uh, you want to come back on that? Yeah, if I can just jump in. I think that part of the problem isn't just the hours worked. As you said, it's, it's, it's the work ethic. Like Germany, for example, work far fewer hours, but they're far more industrious than, than we are in this country because they work harder, not longer. And so part of the issue, I think, and, and this speaks to the HMRC point on that, is that lots of jobs are superfluous in the knowledge economy. Lots of people are just paid to push numbers around on spreadsheets, develop Canva graphics, or deal with the increasingly complicating bureaucracy of tax and law. And so I think if you shrank the size of the state and actually you had a government that wasn't just constantly going for growth and focused on the family and allowed people to have single incomes, we'd have a lot more stability and a lot more meaning rather than people just living alone in their single bedroom apartments stuck on Zoom all day. Um, one of my viewers here says this is basically a divided society. So many people have no chance at working from home. They are out there doing the <coughs> physical stuff that yeah. need to be done. I absolutely hear you. And also, what about the ecosystems around the uh, office blocks, all of your, like, your little cafes and stuff like that, all those independent shops that now, if you don't have those kind of commuters, those workers, what happens to them? And I'll say this from a final word. I'm like a stuck <laughs> record. I always say this on this topic. I think be careful what you wish for, employees, because if you can prove to your boss that, you know what, I can sit at home and do my job, it will not be long before your boss sits there and thinks, hang on a minute, why am I paying Derek, I don't know, 60 grand a year when I could be paying whoever over in the Philippines or in India 20 grand a year? Because if you really can do your job remotely, then why uh, do I have to pay UK wages?